Good evening, everyone. I'm Kari Reagan, the organizer and moderator of Nats Chats, and I'm thrilled to be here with you tonight for the last Nats Chat of the season. And thank you, Christine Brewer, for being our special guest tonight. Thank you and, for having me. Oh, we're thrilled. And this Nats Chat is co-sponsored by the Voice Foundation, and so Peggy Baruti has agreed to co-host with me. So welcome, Peggy. Thank you, Kari. And I'd like to put in a plug for the 48th Annual Voice Foundation Symposium in Philadelphia, which runs from Wednesday, May 29th through Sunday, June 2nd. We have a terrific program this year, as always. Uh, a huge number of scientific papers and presentations. Two of our guests of honors at the gala include Mignon Dunn and Lucina Mara. Our, our masterclass guest this year is Julianne Baird, the great American soprano and Baroque specialist. We have 32 workshops on Friday with hands-on presentations from voice experts from all over the world. So we, we invite you to Philadelphia. We encourage you to come. We'd love to see you. I can't wait to be there. <laughs> Thank you, Kari. Christine, we have to get you there. Yes. Fun. Yeah. We're going to do it. We'll, we'll make that a mission. Okay. All right. And while we're plugging, I'll also for the NAT summer workshop is June 27th and to 29th at St. Olaf, and it's a workshop on diction this year. So that's a um, wonderful opportunity for our members. So again, welcome, uh, Christine. And I just have to tell you, I said this yesterday as well, but the concert, the recital that you and Stephanie and Craig Terry gave in Vegas will forever be a highlight for me. It was Aww. so poignant. And in particular, your Mira, your performance of Mira was breathtaking and transformative. And um, so I just wanted to say that live. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I've got to say, I've been singing that song probably for 30 years. Um, a coach gave it to me one time and I knew the song um, Love Makes the World Go Round. I didn't remember it was from Carnival, but Mira's from that musical as well. And the first time I sang through it with him, I started crying. I said, oh no, I could never sing this in public. And we worked on it for a few weeks and then finally I started singing it. And now it's sort of become um, a special encore for me. And when I sang it at the Wigmore Hall in London for the first time 20 some years ago, they said, we insist that you sing that at least for one of your encores every time you're back. And I have, so it's it's a special, it's a sweet song. Great song. Well, and you set it up so beautifully with the personal story mm. that, you know, yes, that, that made the moment. Oh, thanks. It was Thank really you. special. Well, let's start a little bit with the beyond the bio. I always like to know, what don't we know from your bio? What about your background led you to music and to singing and to the career you've had? Um, there was always music in my family, in my mom's family. Um, I don't remember any time that I wasn't singing and, and I don't remember any time we were at my grandparents' house and there wasn't some kind of music singing or playing instruments or both. And um, as a kid, I used to think it was so, fun's probably not the right word, but when I was awake in the family, we stayed up all night and people sang. And I just thought that's what everybody's family did. So I grew up with music, but I never saw an opera till I went to college. Um, I did play the violin because my mom thought I sang out of tune and asked some <laughs> at our church what she could do about this. I was the eldest child and she couldn't have a child that couldn't sing, you know? And he said, she needs to play a stringed instrument. She needs to play the violin. Oh. So they bought me a violin and got me a teacher. And so I studied classical music for the violin, but really with singing, it was just singing in college, in, in um, high school chorus and stuff and doing musicals and singing in the chorus. And um, I did have a teacher in high school, Mrs. Cosby, who um, sort of took me under her wing and she had me sing Mozart's um, the Alleluia from the Exultate Jubilate when I was a senior in mm -hmm. high school. But I didn't really have um, much training in classical singing until I went to college. Mm -hmm. At that time in your life, did anyone ever listen to you and say, you know, you might have a 
career as a singer or was your voice not at that place at that time? It really wasn't at that place yet. Um, in fact, all through high school, my mom was had also gone to the high school that I did and she had me when she was a teenager. And so there were teachers there who knew her and mm -hmm. um, anytime I sang a solo, anytime in high school that I sang a solo, I would hear these comments from the teachers who were there, or people who came to hear me, and they'd say, well, that was really good, Christy, but you're not quite as good as D." And, <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. and I just, just <laughs> last week did um, Verdi Requiem in um, at SIU Carbondale and in uh, uh -huh. uh, Cape Girardeau, SEMO. And there were people who were there who were, you know, longtime family friends who came to the concerts and I swear to God, there was a guy who used to play guitar for my mom's jazz gospel trio. And he and his wife came backstage. And the first thing he said was, I sure could hear D tonight. <laughs> yeah, so when I was in high school, my voice was really, when I was in college too, it was very small. And um, I was mostly singing, um, when I got to college, singing Handel and Purcell and Bach and you know, uh, a lot of German leader, but no opera stuff. And um, I had a very astute voice teacher, Glenn Freiner, who taught at McKendry College. Now it's McKendry University. Um, he was an organist and he was a singer. And he ran this small music department at the school and couldn't have been a better fit for me because he really did keep my voice light and didn't push it. He's the one who, you know, by my senior year in college said, you know, I think, I think this voice is going to get bigger, um, but let's mm -hmm. not put it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned that a couple times that you, your voice was small and yet, of course, you're known for your glorious, powerful voice. And I've always thought that big voices are big even when you're younger. It's not something you arrive at. I mean, of course, we, our voices continue to grow. Right. But you really consider that when you were younger, you didn't have this profoundly larger voice than the average? No, I, not at all, really. Um, it just started to really grow in my late twenties, and and it was kind of scary. I was working with um, Edmund Leroy, who was at um, Wash U at the time, and um, I could still remember I would take my lessons in his beautiful studio, you know, and um, he was, he would try to get me just to chill out about it because I could feel it growing, but I would stop and I'd sing a phrase of whatever we were working on. And I'd say, wait, was that too loud? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was not too loud, you know? And, um, I, I was just very timid about it, you know? And mm -hmm. I was a little afraid about it. And it took me actually a few years to get comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, Stephen Smith was in St. Louis at that time, mm -hmm. and Ed had gone on to teach in uh, Florida. And um, he said to me one time, he had heard me do a recital with his wife, Carol Smith, who was playing piano for me. And um, at that time, I was having an issue with my top, and it was I was it was sharp, you know. I was a violinist; I could tell there was something that was not quite right. And I went to t talk to him, and you know, see if he might help me, and I could study with him. And he said, you know, if you sang everything like you sing Harold Arlen, you wouldn't have any vocal issues. And mm -hmm. I thought, what does that mean? I said, the Harold Arlen I sing doesn't really have a lot of high notes. Or He said, well, you just sing it differently. And he mentioned Mira, too. He said, you sing that differently. You sing it from a different place. And he said, when you start singing Strauss or Schubert or something, he said, all of a sudden, it's just like you're afraid to let your real... Um, your real personality and your real um, heart come through the music. And so we worked on that for quite some time. And he would even sometimes in my lessons say, okay, let's hear a little bit of Come Rain or Come Shine. Okay, now let's now let's look at Abscheulischer, um, you know, from Fidelio. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it, it just took me a while to sort of settle into the fact that my voice was gonna be a bigger voice. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Well, this lends itself to your, the wonderful story of persistence that you shared with me that I really want you to share because post college, you had yeah. this wonderful story about persistence. Would you share that? I, I would like to. Yes. Um, I am. Um, I was out of college and, and my voice was growing and I was starting to sing some, uh, 
uh, some of the bigger um, Mozart stuff, uh, Anna and uh, Vitalia. And, and so my teacher suggested I try out for the Met auditions. And I did a couple times. Um, and sometimes I would place on that first level and then get to the second level and didn't go on, you know. And one of those times, Evelyn Lear happened to be one of the judges. And she spoke to me afterwards and she said, I can hear that your voice is going to the head towards the Strauss and some Wagner at some point. And I think you really should sing for Birgit Nielsen. Well, I said, well, sure, that sounds like a great idea. And she said, well, I know she's going to be in Washington, D.C. in a few months. And, and she gave me some information about it. So I came back home. And the first thing I did was call to see, could I please get in one of Miss Nielsen's classes? And the guy at the straight school said, well, no, no, you can't. The classes are full. So um, I was singing in the chorus at the Opera Theater at that time. I'd been in the chorus um, since the early 80s. And um, I called Charles McKay, who was the general director at the time, and told him about this opportunity. And he said, if you can get into the class, we will pay for your airfare, the, the fee, whatever it costs. Right. So armed with this extra clout, I thought, well, I'm going to call back the next day. And I called the guy and and I, I gave him all this information. And he said, well, OK, but no, I'm sorry, the classes are full. Well, I called. I, I don't know how many times I called him, but I know I called for at least a week and kept asking, Has someone dropped out. Somebody canceled, somebody, not. and finally, I think he just got tired of hearing from me. He said, <laughs> all right, you can be in the leader class. You can't be in the opera class. You can be in the leader class. You're going to be the last one on the list. You may not get to sing. What are you going to sing? And I said, Ken Studaslan, Hugo Bull. Great. Okay, we'll see you. Hung up. And then I realized I had forgotten to ask if she was giving any private lessons. And so I called back. And <laughs> <laughs> exasperated he said oh, you're in the class now what else do you want and I said well I forgot to ask will Miss Nielsen be giving any private lessons and yes but you know not not for you okay <laughs> you know, and, and this is when, when I'm doing master classes and talking to young singers this is where I tell them I this uh, maybe I'm a nerd you know whatever but I put together three folders of my favorite repertoire one for me one for Miss Nielsen and one for a pianist just in case I got to so I put them in my suitcase and took them, you know, went off to Washington, D.C. And I got to the class and um, the first couple singers only got to sing a couple phrases. And she stopped them and said, I, I'm not I don't think you're quite ready for this yet. So please take a seat. <laughs> so on one hand, I'm thinking, oh, man, I felt sorry for those singers. But then I thought, what a chance that I'm going to get to sing tonight. <laughs> so, I got called up on the last one and I sang one praise of Kids Do Us Lot and the hand went up and I just thought, oh my God, I'm gonna go back and tell Charles McKay that I didn't get to sing and he wasted, the opera theater wasted their money. And she just said, um, uh, where are you from? And I told her I lived in a little town near St. Louis. Why did you come all the way to Washington DC? And I said, well, um, I met Evelyn Lear a few months ago, and she suggested that I try to sing for you if I ever got a chance to do that. And she said, okay. Well, she said, who taught you how to sing? And I said, well, mostly my mom, really just singing mm -hmm. with her. Okay. And then she had me start over, and I sang, and she gave me some really beautiful comments and some suggestions, and I was just on cloud nine. Hmm. And then I got a phone call when I got back to the hotel. And uh, the gentleman I had been speaking to said, well, I drove Miss Nielsen back to her hotel tonight, and all she talked about was your singing, and she wants to give you a private lesson tomorrow morning at 10, but if you oh can't be there, there are no other options. I said, I will be there. So I went, and we had about an hour, an hour and a half session, and um, she invited me to come to Europe. She was doing this really special Fun. It was an interesting class. It was in this little uh, village called Bukeberg, Germany, near um, Hamburg. And she chose five singers. Uh, there, there were a couple from Sweden and one from Germany and two from America. And every day we, we met in this little castle in this beautiful, not a little castle, in a castle, but in this beautiful studio. Um, and we sang. And each of us had about an hour session with her, but in front of the other singers. So it was like a master class for those of us who were listening. 
and um, she sent me to do some auditions while I was there. And she was so wonderful in just answering questions for me because she could tell my voice was changing, but I was singing really primarily um, uh, Mozart for her. And she said, as long as you can sing Mozart like this, keep doing it because she said it will keep your voice healthy and youthful, her two favorite words. And um, we did work on Elsa and Elizabeth. We worked on a couple things, you know, that were a little bit lighter, more lyric Wagner. Um, and from then on, she became a, a, a friend and a mentor to me. Whenever I, I sang something in London and the BBC radio recorded it, I would send her the recording and she would write back, you know, a, a letter to me with critique about, now, you know, you really shouldn't shouldn't breathe here in this phrase, or this is where, you know, um, this isn't correct, or, or um, and she was just, she was great. When I sang my first Isolde, it was in London, and um, and I sent her the recording, and she wrote back, Frau Isolde, with three exclamations. She said, wow. And I was 40 when I sang my, my first Isolde. Mm -hmm. I was 40. And she said, and she, she, talked about, you know, that this is the way you should sing this, approach it as a lyric soprano. And I have to say, I really approach everything as a lyric soprano. And I know my voice is big, but I don't approach things like a dramatic soprano, you know, because I don't really, I still feel like I'm a lyric soprano with a big voice. And mm -hmm. um, so she was, she even, um, I can't remember if I told you this story before or not, but um when I did my first immolation scene, it was with the Swedish radio orchestra. And I wrote to her, I was in Lyon doing Ariadne for a couple months and I was working on this while I was there. And I told her when I was gonna do it, but I didn't hear back from her. So I thought maybe she was out of town. So I did the concert. And when I got back to my dressing room, um, uh, an usher came to the door and said, you have a phone call downstairs at the stage door. And no one knew I was there except my husband. So of course I thought, oh my God, somebody's died or something's happened. And I got downstairs and I answered the phone and she says, hello, Christina. And it was, it was Birgit. <laughs> and she had just gotten <laughs> out of town and she listened to the live broadcast and we shared a few little pleasantries and she said, oh, your voice sounds healthy and youthful. Okay, now. And then she <laughs> gave me a list of things. She said, now, I don't think you should ever sing the, the, um, the things in the low register any louder than you sang it tonight. It's up to the conductor to keep the orchestra down. If you start singing too loudly and um, forcing that voice, you'll get a wobble in your voice. It'll make your voice sound old. I mean, she was just giving me a lesson over the phone and it was wow. wonderful. Wow. So all of that, I think about it quite often. It would never have happened if I had hung up after that first time he said no, or if I had said, okay, well, she's not giving any private lessons. I'll just go and have that master class you know and so i tell this to young singers a lot that you know it is there is some truth to being at the right place at the right time yes but you also have to be super prepared and i think just as as much as possible make yourself prepared for what you want to try to do well and as yeah. we talked yesterday that persistence right up to the point of obnoxious you know yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. where where is that fine line, you know? Yeah. And I just, I just think that story is so remarkable. And the fact that you packed three folders, right? <laughs> that to me, it's like that is making something come true for yourself because you envision. Yeah, it. yeah. Those, that's really important. Yeah, I mean, and it's little stuff like that. I mean, I when I I um uh, go to Webster University in the fall and I talk about what it means to be a singer and what it means as you're you're planning your studies or planning auditions there are little things that we talk about like you know having a folder ready for an accompanist who may be sight reading it you know if you're going into an audition to make sure that everything in it is perfect you know that you don't have and it, you know you all probably talk to accompanists who have said yeah well, that page was upside down or there was a page mm -hmm. missing or it was a photocopy that had been done about a hundred times i couldn't read it and you know, don't make the assumption that the pianist for your audition is going to be able to just, you know, play it if you don't give him a good, him or her a good copy. So I, that kind of stuff, you know, I, I tend to be a little bit um, anal retentive about that.
Can I ask a question about your voice since it went through this transition and metamorphosis? Mm -hmm. Did it hit a period, I'm assuming that happened in your late 20s, did it hit a period in your 30s and 40s where you felt like it was sort of consistent or has it ever had a period where it sort of plateaued and you felt like, okay, this is it and this is where it is for now? Or well, has it just been a... <laughs> It's, you know what, I, I found all along, um, there have been different times, and, and sometimes it's happened with a certain role that I sang. Um, uh -huh. One in particular was, um, oh, I cannot remember the year we did this in St. Louis. It was um, Haydn's Armida. And mm -hmm. I love hearing um, those kind of uh, coloratura roles sung with a bigger voice. And my voice was starting to uh -huh. bit, get bigger then. I probably... I want to say 35. I, I wish I would have thought about this before we, we talked tonight. I could have given you the date. But um, as I was working on that for the probably a year before we started rehearsals, and then we had a couple months of rehearsals and performances, I really felt that my voice um, got higher, that, that my range got a little bit higher. And uh -huh. uh, I attribute it to that role because it was, it was up, you know, it was in a, a higher register than the Mozart that I had been singing prior to that. And mm -hmm. um, so I thought it would be a good exercise. I can't believe I'm going to share this story. And I may, I hope, maybe I did. I don't know. I may have shared this in Las Vegas. But um, I thought, well, you know what? It's not that much off from the Queen of the Night. It's maybe a third, you know, lower. And um, mm -hmm. so I said to my teacher at Wash U, look, I want to just look at that you know, one of the arias and, um, but, but I don't want any of your students, you know, at the university to hear me. So could I come at nine o'clock in the mornings, you know? And so <laughs> I know it takes me a half hour to drive to St. Louis. So I would get up <laughs> and I would warm up here at home and I go in for my lesson and I could sing it about half the time, about 50% of yeah. the time. Yeah. And one day I was working on it at home and we live in this old house that my husband you know, we've been renovating for years and he was upstairs, I don't know, peeling wallpaper or something. And he came down and he said, and he's not a musician. He said, what are you singing? I said, just some Mozart. <laughs> well, what Mozart? I mean, he'd heard me do a lot of Mozart. I said, oh, he's, well, what's it from? I said, oh, it's from Magic Flute. And he just stood at the door and he said, well, what is it? And I said, just one of the Queen of the Night arias. And, and then he just had a pause for a second. And he went, somebody hired you to do this? <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of my, you know, practicing that at home. But I still, I still used it as an exercise. Yeah, and I still, yeah. I, when I vocalize, there are a few phrases from the Haydn Armida that I, I just mm -hmm. sing. They're just in my, and, and I know, do you know what I mean? Like you've got some, a phrase yeah. you can sing and it's like, yep. oh, good, yep. I'm good. Um, yeah. So throughout my, my career, there have been roles like that that I felt like either, you know, like this one, my range felt higher. Um, mm -hmm. when, when I started singing um, Ariadne, um, I felt mm -hmm. that my voice was getting a little bigger in size. But mm -hmm. I I'll go back to what I said earlier. I, I, I still approach it as though I'm a lyric soprano. I approach everything that way. So, um, yep. yeah, yeah. And that's, that's great to why I'm in in uh, Vegas we all, everyone commented your voice is so youthful and fresh and healthy I mean it truly is you know there I mean we talked about this a little bit yesterday even about I think genetics play a big role in that but also for me I never because my voice was was changing and growing in my early 30s and because there weren't a lot of um options for me to sing an opera rather th other than singing things with the opera theater chorus I just sort of like getting into the Birgit Nielsen master class just started calling conductors from the St. Louis area and auditioning for them and I learned probably 90 percent of my concert repertoire during those years oh, singing goodness. things like Messiah and Brahms Requiem um oh gosh Elijah um yep. things like that and I think even after I started doing opera, I had a, a pretty big uh, career already going in concert repertoire. And I had a very astute manager in um, London. And this would have been probably in 
the mid to late eighties. And I was over in Leipzig doing, um, Oh gosh, now I can't remember what I was singing. I think it was the glacolytic mass of Jana Czech. Um, and he said, when you're finished, I want you to fly to London. We, we have an appointment. It will, you stay there. I'm just going to drive. I've called all these conductors. I'm going to drive you around the UK for a week. And I want you to bring all your repertoire. Leader, concert leader that's orchestrated, Strauss leader, um, Elijah, bring your, your um, you know, your oratorial rep, bring your concert rep, bring your opera rep. He took me around. I sang for Andrew Litton, Neville Mariner, Franz Velzer mm -hmm. Mist, and every one of those auditions, um, I got calls, you know, to, to sing with them. And so mm -hmm. my concert career really kept going. And because of that, I would maybe, maybe only do a couple operas a year. And for me, I think that's what helped me keep my voice uh -huh. youthful. And, mm -hmm. and Birgit always said to me too, she said, you know, when I was singing, she said, most of the time I took the train. I didn't fly to where I was going. I took the train. I had time to really rest yeah. in between engagements and study my music or whatever. And so I think that's probably also something that's helped, you know? Yeah. yeah. I want to remind our attendees too, please ask questions. There's the question box, so don't hesitate to type a question. Otherwise, uh, Peggy and I were, will happily monopolize her time. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, without disparaging a lot of the bigger singers who are out there now, my concern or my gut feeling is that many singers in their 20s and early 30s may be trying to sing too big too soon or just trying to sing too big. And I think it's problematic. I mean, we're always asking ourselves in the opera world, why aren't there more great singers? They're good voice, they're fantastic voices that you hear every day. But why don't they develop into great artists in their 30s and 40s and even 50s? And I personally feel very strongly that there's pressure on young singers. I think it's volume, I think it's size, I think it's heft. And to me, it's such a tragic mistake. I mean, there are some young dramatic voices that do develop earlier than others, but most voices need to think lyric their whole careers, you know, or have that concept in mind and not the, at least not the concept of more sound, more space, more pressure. I mean, I, I really admire your sound because of that very thing. It does have a youthful, healthy, gorgeous, shimmery sound. And yet it has all the warmth and richness that you've allowed to, to come into the voice in sort of a natural ev evolutionary process while you continue to sing well. Well, you know what? I, I, I do think it's, it's about... It's not about volume. I remember one time I was on tour with the San Francisco Symphony um, doing, um, I can't even remember what we were doing then, um, but we were in Europe and we had a stop in Munich for a couple of days and we did some concerts there. And my manager from London said, you know, while you're there, they'd like to hear you um, at, at Munich at the opera. They would like, they're thinking of doing an Ariadne. So I took, you know, I took that score and I took a couple things and I did the audition. And they were singing, they were hearing a couple other singers. So they would just have us come in and sing one aria and then go off and come back. And I went in and I said, would you like to hear Eskip Dein Reich? No, 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 no. Uh, could you sing Ab Scheulich here from uh, Fidelio? And I said, sure, okay. So I sang that and um, I didn't have the score, but they, they got a score from the library and I sang that. Uh -huh. and then I went back and the second time I came back to sing, do you want to hear something now from our, no, we've, in fact, we heard you sing it in London. We, we, how about some Wagner? Could you do um, Die Steuer Halle? Mm -hmm. Okay, sure, okay. And so then I finished and, and um, I was getting ready to leave, to go back to my hotel. And a gentleman who had been out, there were three or four people sitting out in the um, auditorium. He came back and said, um, you know, if you came here, I could teach you how to sing louder. And I just looked at him. <laughs> And I said, well, you know what? And I, I, I'm not usually this kind of bold, but I just said, you failed the audition. He said, what? <laughs> I said, 
I didn't sing loud enough with a piano. God knows, an orchestra, you wouldn't be able to hear me. Well, no, no, that's not what mm -hmm. I meant. I could just teach you to sing from your toes and sing louder. He kept saying, sing louder. And I said, you know, first of all, I'm not some 20 year old. And if you just want somebody to sing louder, that's just going to ruin the voice. And I said, you're going to get somebody singing with a big old wobble. And I said, so you're, I'm done. And I left. And I'm, I went back to my hotel. And I called the manager and I said, I, I don't think they're going to call me. So just want to give you a heads up on that. Well, the next day he called me. He said, they actually did call um, and said that they're, they're, they do some concerts and they want you to come and do um, the Shostakovich is it 12 or 14 that's for baritone and soprano? They want you to do mm -hmm. that and they want you to do uh, the Britain uh, Les Illuminations in a concert. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, okay. Well, I said, um, here's the deal. Um, you have to make sure that Herr Schmidt is not allowed at any of the rehearsals or any of the, I don't want to talk to him. And uh, this oh, was no. going to be in a couple of years. And, and I said, I'm glad you to negotiate a really good fee because I think they were very rude to me, you know. So two years later, mm -hmm. flash forward, I get there and uh, Mark Wigglesworth was conducting and I looked around and I asked someone, is Herr Schmidt here? And they said, oh no, he got fired because he was always telling singers, you know, like after a dress rehearsal, a final dress, he would go up and say to them, were you marking today? Because I, I just don't think you were singing loud enough. <laughs> Oh my God! Uh, maybe he had a hearing problem or something, or uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But that whole thing of singing louder, and, and, and I say this sometimes, and I do hear a lot of young singers. Um, I'm on the Sullivan board um, in New York, uh -huh. and so um, I sit in on auditions, and there are three or four of us who will listen to these young singers, and um, and I do master classes and stuff. But it seems like there's so many of these 20 and even 30 year olds that are just singing everything loud. And I I get it if you've got a big voice, but I, I say sometimes to them, just singing everything loudly gets boring. And, and I use the example of when my daughter was in high school and I used to be yelling at her about something that she had done, um, I could see she tuned me out after about five minutes. And mm. it's the same way, if you, yeah, you could be thrilled with a big voice, but if all you hear is just bombastic singing and you don't hear any kind of nuance, kind of, I don't know, a pianissimo now and then, a flow to high note. I mean, that's why I think too, I, I love singing Strauss because there are all those opportunities mm -hmm. to be able to float some stuff. I just think yeah. it's more interesting and it's healthier, so. Absolutely. You're my new best friend. <laughs> I'm, cl I'm claiming you as my new best friend. That's all there is to it. Can I ask you which Mozart roles you did early on? I think you, did you mention Donna Anna? I did Anna, I did the Countess. Um, uh -huh. And um, I looked at Elvira too. And my daughter, of course, mm -hmm. traveled with me a lot when she was younger and she must have heard me do Anna, I don't know, 40 times, I don't know. She told me one yeah. time, she said, Mom, you know, could you just do Elvira? Because she said, you just do a lot <laughs> of whining. And <laughs> that would just, I, I didn't suit me as well. Um, Vitalia. Yeah. Um, yep. So those were the ones I sang. And I did a lot of the um, Mozart concert artists. Charles McCarris and I became really good buddies. Uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of a baptism by fire. I got a call one morning at six from my manager in London. He said, I know, I'm sorry I'm waking you up, but Charles McCarris is going to call you in about 20 minutes because he's just let the Anna go, who's supposed to do uh -huh. this performance at the Edinburgh Festival and then record um, Giovanni. And I was working on it to sing at Covent Garden and at the New York City Opera. So it was in, he knew it was, you know, in my wheelhouse. So he said, he's going to call you. So he did. And um, we spoke for a few minutes on the phone and he's, and I can't do his accent, you know, but he says, well, you know, uh, your manager had me listen to your Yoriante recording. And he said, you know, that's in German. I said, yes, yes, sir. He said, and you know, Giovanni's in Italian. I said, yes, I know that. Well, how's your Italian? I said, well, nobody's complained about it so far. Well, I'll be the judge of that. I'll see you tomorrow afternoon in Edinburgh. And I and I got there. I went at two, two sang through the whole role. And he's kind of gruff. He was a little gruff and abrupt. And it just, he sort of, you'll do. And I'll see you tomorrow at rehearsal. And 
<laughs> from then on, I, <laughs> I loved working with him. We did lots of Mozart. We did um, several Fidelios together. I did one uh -huh. for his birthday in London. Um, but he was the one who introduced me to a lot of the, the Mozart concert arias. And we uh -huh. would do both in, in concerts all the time. So I did lots of the oh, things, nice. um, you know, uh, Mozart roles that were for the bigger voices. And then those Mozart uh -huh. concert arias. Which concert arias? Which concert arias did you do? Oh, we did. Um, yeah. Bella Bajama, um, mm -hmm. Oh, oh shoot. Um, well, it, it's it's not in my mind right now. I'll think on that. Sorry, no, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. Later, but um, yeah. but again, I think all of that kind of stuff kept kept the voice, as Barry mm -hmm. said, kept moving, and um, you know. So yeah. we have a couple wonderful questions. So let, let's get them okay. uh, those in. The first one is from Karen Brunson, our current NATS oh, president, with whom you just bought her book yesterday. I did. Uh, I did. It's coming in a couple days. Yes. Um, she wants to know, can you share with us how you keep both professional singing and singing for fun in your life? Oh, gosh. Well, um, I think she maybe heard me talk last year about the hoot nanny we have at our house. <laughs> I'm coming. I am coming. I told a friend about this today. <laughs> it's usually the Saturday of Labor Day, unless I've got a gig somewhere. You know, we will have to. Oh my God. Peggy, but, we have to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm there. there. It, you, in, a little, in Lebanon, Illinois. I mean, yeah, but yeah. There are people who come to this now. Last year we had about a hundred people. <laughs> And I don't even know half of them. I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> something to our gate. And I look at my husband, I'll go, who is that? He said, I don't know. I thought it was somebody you knew. And if they got a guitar case or a banjo case or whatever, they do. And, and I've got one cousin who comes up from Dallas. I have a brother who comes from Denver, one from Louisville. And people bring whatever, harmonicas, guitars, ukuleles, mandolins, banjos. And we just... This is what my family did. Ross and I started, my husband Ross and I started doing this about, our daughter's 34. So I think probably about 35 years ago, it was before she was born. And it was very informal then. We maybe had 10 or 12 people in our backyard, just, you know, we bring some food. Now it's a big production. My brothers are grilling and people bring food. And we have a, <laughs> the early part of the program is just with the little kids singing, you know, and I had a couple little boys one year came up to me and they said, We'll sing with the little kids, but we're here for the real music. Just, you know. Just. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I've got a five-year-old grandson who's grown up. Well, he, my daughter went into labor six, five years. He's five years old, uh, right after the, the hoot nanny, and had him sit next to him. <laughs> And so he's just grown up with these hoot nannies. And I don't know, you know what? I, I, this probably sounds really lame just saying this, but. I sing the same way. I, I, I don't know. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just think if you're singing to tell a story and you sing well, you can sing well singing a hymn or singing a bluegrass tune or singing an aria. And mm -hmm. I, I got some flack when I did um, the Mother Abbess and the Sound of Music at the Lyric Opera a few years ago. Few of the hmm. Wagner Society people, you know, gave me a hard time. Like, how dare you? How could you do this? You know, I said, well, I'm singing with my voice. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not doing anything differently. I'm just, so that was a little frustrating for me. But I, yeah. so I just keep it in my, the same voice. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You sing with your authentic voice all the time. I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah, uh -huh. I think I do. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, when I'm at church, when I'm in town, if I'm singing at church, you know, my daughter, when she was in high school, used to say, God, mom, could you just not sing the hymns so loud? And so. <laughs> do you love now, hymns? Wait, do, do you love hymns? I do. I do. So now, and then sometimes if there's like a visitor at the church <laughs> and they're sitting near us, you know, they'll come up after and they'll go, you should sing in the choir. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah so you know I just have so much fun singing and um I have people that now because you know they know I'm 63 I'm it's out there everybody I can't lie about my age because I'm too stupid to remember like what year I was supposed to have been born if I was lying about it but so, you know, 
so are you still singing? I said, well, I still have a few stories I want to tell. I and love so I, yeah. yeah, I'm still singing. So the Karen says, it, Karen wants you to know that she loved your mother, Abbas. She cried so I couldn't go out for intermission. So <laughs> however you sing it was perfect. You know? Oh my God. I and loved singing that. I loved it. Here's another comment from my dear friend, Dean Williamson, opera conductor. And he said, it's so great to hear you talk about Macris. He's my favorite Mozart conductor. And I love the Giovanni recording you did with him. Oh. What do you think made his conducting of Mozart so wonderful? Wow, that's a great question. His conducting of Janacek was wonderful as well. And those were, those were two composers I think he really loved. Um, I think because he he was so in love with Mozart and and um he was a very clear conductor he was very he could be sometimes a little um brusque but he was always really clear about what he wanted and he loved putting ornaments in things when I did Fidelio with him for his birthday he he said to me one time I forgot to do one of the ornaments in a rehearsal and I said I'm sorry I'm sorry maestro I will do this he says, well, he says, I, I want, I, I've had singers before that just for, forget to do it in the performance. And it really, you know, I said, I promise I won't do that. I won't do that. But he was, he had interesting ornaments that he would um, give us. I don't think I had any in the, in the Giovanni. I don't think he had anything for me. I can't remember, but, um, but he was so clear about what he wanted and he was very good at explaining what he wanted. And, um, and then he was just clear as he conducted as well. And there was so much joy in his conducting. I actually sang one of his last concerts in London with the um, with the the London Symphony Orchestra. We did um, the Liebes Tote, and we did um, we might have done the Immolation. We did a couple Wagner um, excerpts, but I think it, uh, anyway. Um, at that time, he was walking with a cane, you know, backstage. And as we got ready to go on the stage, there were some steps we had to go up. And I just offered my arm before we got up to the steps. And he pushed it away. And he got up those steps. He did sit for that concert. That was one of the few times I saw him seated in the in the performance. And um, But once he started conducting, there was all that energy and joy. And it, it was contagious. It made me... He gave me the permission to feel that joy too. And so that's that's one of the reasons I love singing with Charles. I love that. Here we have another question. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Shara Boom. And she says, How do you deal with illness, colds, laryngitis, etc., with your performance schedule? Oh, that's good. Um I, I have to say, I think I've only had laryngitis once. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't a time that I was performing. Um I've had issues, you know, with colds and stuff like or allergies. Um, I don't know. My daughter is a nurse. And now she tells the story that when she was a child, she said, you know, mom, when I was a kid, I used to tell my friends if they came over after school and if they sneezed around you, that they had to say they had allergies or you'd make them go home. <laughs> And I said, I don't think I ever sent anybody home. And she said, oh, oh, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> um, oh. But you know what? And my husband was a school teacher. He taught seventh and eighth grade. So, you know, we had a lot of germs coming into this house. And maybe the years that I taught school, too, I don't know if I built up an immunity to some of that. I, I don't know. Um, but if I feel a little bit peaked, as my mom used to say, and feel like something might be coming on, I make this homemade chicken soup, which probably it's all in my mind, but it makes me better. I I, I, I get, you know, uh, <laughs> chicken, and then I, I put a ton of garlic and a lot of cayenne pepper, so it's hot and yeah. it's spicy. And, um, and then, you know, onions and carrots and celery, and I just eat that for about, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> I, I know. And my husband, even if he sees he's like, don't you know you're making chicken soup? I'm really, I, I'm good. I'm good. But I just make it like preventively for myself. And I said, okay, yeah. fine. All right. But um, so I do that. And I, 
right now, you see, I've got a water bottle. I drink almond milk in the morning and I drink water. I, I don't drink caffeine. I don't, um, occasionally if I have tea, I try to get something that's not caffeinated. Um, I, it's just really boring. I, I just, <laughs> I mean, it really is. I, I don't really, I don't know. And I think probably it's just, maybe I've built up an immunity to stuff. I mean, now I've got this five-year-old grandson and sometimes he came, he came in the other day, he was here and he had been outside playing and he, he needed to drink water and he saw my water bottle there and he said, I haven't got a cold. Could I have a drink of your water? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, but you can just get your own cup too, and then you can. <laughs> so, Christine, I, I... do you do you think you just have good genes? Oh, I, you know what? I think there's a lot of truth in that. I really do. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we have another uh, terrific question from Ray Mira Hilliard. With all of your experience and groundedness in your instrument, do you find that you are still learning or discovering things about your instrument? And are you still actively pursuing new works? I love that I question. Know, that is a good question, in fact. And it's right here because I've been working on my texts. I'm doing... Oh, I saw that on your website. Oh. Not, not Kunaganda, because I'm sure a lot of folks would be thinking I'm singing Kunaganda, but I'm not. I'm singing the old lady. Yeah. And, and I'm like, really? She doesn't even have a name, but she doesn't have a name in the in Voltaire's book either. She's just an old lady. And um, so yes, I am. And I'm working um, I've got this, I don't know where it is now. Oh yeah. And maybe some of your some of your people listening know about this program, but I have to have a Polish accent in this, which is like an added little layer. Um and so um, our director suggested I get online and look for David Allen Stern. And he's got for English speaking uh, actors, these lessons that you can take if you want to you have Cockney accent that you've got to do or Russian or and there's one for Polish. And there are five uh -huh. lessons that you can print out with how the vowels oh. are different, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> Ending consonants, how they're different. And then there are also some audio things you can do to practice. So it's been really fun for me. And my husband always says, when you're working on a new piece or a new role, he said, you are just so happy. And I, I do a lot of um, a program at St. Louis Symphony this year called um, Celebrating Women Composers. And I did a piece by Stephanie Berg uh, for clarinet, piano, and soprano. And um, it was three movements, three, three, three songs called Prayers. And it was amazing. And we did a concert at Powell Hall in St. Louis and it was so much fun. So yes, I am still working on new things and I find a lot of, okay, yes, I'm nervous about it, but um, but it's it's also really fun and joyful. So. But I love the part of the question about learning and discovering things about your instrument. But I have to say what I learned about you yesterday was that you didn't really even warm up until you were about 40 years old. You were a person that came to singing technique even quite naturally. Not to say that you didn't work hard. Right, right. But yeah. you really, you said the genetics of your family history and. Yeah. And, and, and also we were just always singing. And so, you know, I don't know. And, and I'm sure some of, some of the folks listening if, for instance, if you're rehearsing an opera and you're singing six days a week or whatever, I, I usually, if I'm get up in the morning, my voice is still feels yep. warm back to me. I don't know if yep. other people experience that too, but it, it does to me. So I've heard that before from a number of singers. I think, you know, just coming from the medical world side of it as well, I think that the the reality is that. Um, everybody's voice is different and everybody's body is different and everybody's genetics is different and everybody's endurance is different you know no two people are exactly the same so people have to figure out what is right for them mm -hmm. you know do they need to warm up regardless or do how much warm up do they need i was going to ask you um even now if you're not working particularly on a project do you sing every day or are there days when you don't sing I think I do. I mean, uh -huh. I, yeah, I, I'm singing something usually all the time. 
Um, yeah. I remember about a year ago, my grandson was here and he said, um, where do you go when you go to work? Because he knows his mommy goes to the <laughs> hospital. And I FaceTime with him when I'm out of town and stuff. And I said, well, I just go where people want to hear me sing or teach singers. He said, wait a minute. You mean your job is singing? Because all we do is let's go yeah. to the song room and we sing. We just sing and I get out, you know, the mandolin or the guitar or something and, and we play and and so yeah, I probably sing every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a little, yeah. Can I do you play the ukulele? I don't have my ukulele here. I don't um I played it when I was a kid and I know okay. Steph has been playing it and I, I played the violin. I taught myself to play guitar. I play harmonica. Uh -huh. And, um, oh, I'm doing this really cool project. And for anyone who's listening who lives near Springfield, Illinois, this is going to be in August, um, August the 9th. They've asked me to come there and do this um, panel discussion with a bluegrass banjo player from the Chicago, Skokie, Illinois area. And so it's sort of the show, okay, we have this girl from, you know, the hillbilly from Southern Illinois, from Grand Tower, Illinois, who sings opera. And then this guy who plays bluegrass stuff from where you don't normally think that we would, you know, be doing mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. then we're going to meld, uh, we're each going to do some of our, our repertoire and then do some stuff together. And I am Ooh. so looking forward to that. I'm, I'm sort of trying to decide if I'm going to take my harmonica or not. Um, mm -hmm. I have played a couple times in recitals, and um, sometimes, you know, my husband Ross will say, okay, tonight it seemed like you're a little bit of a hillbilly, so just just throwing that out there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I love that kind of stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's great. So we have a question from Kimberly Valda. Is it true that you sang Moon River while you were in labor? It is true I sang during labor. They had to do an emergency C-section because I was um, I was determined to have that baby, you know, the Lamaze thing and all that stuff. And after, after 36 hours of labor, the doctors came in and said, you know what, we're going to do a C-section. The, the baby's head's too big. It's not even in the birth canal and stuff. And all of a sudden when I got in the um, the operating room, I just got so nervous. And one of my doctors said, hey, you know what? He said, what do you do before a concert? And I said, well, I just kind of hum and stuff. So I was humming and, you know, and they gave me a little spinal um, uh, block. And um, he said, do you know Some Enchanted Evening? That's one of my favorite songs. And I said, <laughs> and my husband couldn't come in the operating room. He was out in the hall on the phone. And he said, all of a sudden I hear you singing Some Enchanted Evening. I thought, what the hell? And, he said, you should have changed the words, some enchanted evening, you'll meet a stranger across a crowded womb. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do that. I have also, um, yeah, well, I'm not going to go any further, but uh, probably that's. Don't stop now. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes I, I do sing in inappropriate times, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god as i work with you know our young 20 something emerging singers they that want to have a career that you have had right you you are living the dream and i want to know what what would you say has been the uh greatest joy out of that adventure and the greatest challenge out of giving to live the dream that so many want. There have been a lot of joys about it in meeting people like Birgit Nielsen and getting to work with conductors like Sir Charles McCarris. And, you know, those are certainly the highlights and the, the high points. For me and my friends who know me, you know, I had my daughter Elizabeth when I was in my late 20s. And so I took her along with me for a long time and my mom would travel with us and stuff. Um, but when I had to make decisions sometimes and I couldn't be at home for something like a birthday or something, that was really difficult for me. Um, it was challenging. And I had to say my husband was, I really couldn't have done it without his help here at home. And um, I feel like I missed out on some things in her life 
um, and even now, I mean, we're very close, but I still feel she has a connection with Ross that she doesn't have with me, you know? Um, mm. But it's, um, so that's sort of bittersweet. Um, but then she'll talk about some of the stuff we did when, you know, remember when we were in Italy, mom, and we took the train here and she's, and she talks about these stories and adventures that we had very mm -hmm. lovingly. Um, but yeah, I think it's always for me, it was always about the balance of, of family and career, but I think that's true in all professions with women I've talked to. So, um, mm -hmm. but I think I would just say to singers, everybody's journey is going to be different. And there were times I probably said no more than yes, really early in my career when people said, oh, we, you know, we'd love to have you sing Tosca. And I was like, you know, 30 <laughs> or, you know, and my voice was just starting to kind of blossom then. And, or Aida, you know, I was offered Aida or Pamina from the same company. <laughs> like, okay, no. Oh. And, no. <laughs> so um, I think you have to be the best judge of that and use your gut feelings about sometimes there are some things you might want to say, I might want to do that in five years. I don't think I'm ready to do that now. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard yeah. though. It's a hard thing to do. You mentioned that yesterday too, trusting your instincts as a young singer, both in regards to teachers yes. that you work yeah. with, opportunities that you have. Yeah, and, I would and, say I would say that you have such a level head, though. I mean, I I know I, we all know lots of young singers, and you do have to learn to trust your instincts. But sometimes people have to mature in order for that to be a good way to live. You true. sound like somebody that was very level-headed from the onset. I, I think so, and I do think mm -hmm. it was a lot of that early singing with my mom, who who mm -hmm. didn't have any, you know, training. Uh, professional training, but she just knew how to tell a story. And sadly, yeah. she died quite young with ALS. And so she was oh. still singing up until like a few months before she was diagnosed and, and she was in her late fifties. And so, you know, but she just, it was just about telling the story to her. And yeah. when she heard me sing, you know, she heard me sing at Covent Garden, she heard me sing and she would always be, you know, that was really beautiful. You sang so beautifully, but your voice sounded great. But I didn't think you were always singing from your heart. Mm. And it used to piss me off, you know. But uh -huh. she was she would allow herself to be really vulnerable when she sang. And I think I learned it from her. Yeah. Unfortunately, not very much until after she passed away did I really kind of get it, you know. Sure. But, uh, yeah. Sure. But I do think that, that a lot of that level headed stuff came from just being raised by someone who was so straightforward about what she did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's great well this has been just a remarkable remarkable hour and i had such fun yesterday too uh, talking with you <laughs> i did too you're so delightful this is really thank you so well, thank much you. Uh, we just can't thank you yeah um, and I just want to thank our attendees for joining me this year. It's been really qu uh, quite a remarkable year as I think about what I'm going to put together next year. It's going to be hard to pass this, um, surpass this year. We started with Karen Brunson and then Mary Saunders Barton and Norman Spivey talking about cross training, Chad and Ballantyne and Carrie Obert discussing twang, Lynn Helding and Lynn Maxfield discussing motor learning theory, Ian Howell discussing psychoacoustics and then Scott McCoy, um, the state of pedagogy today. And of course, bringing it around to the finish tonight with Christine Brewer. So quite a remarkable season. Wow, that sounds like it. I feel very honored to be in that group that you just well, mentioned. We're the ones that are honored and they're all archived so people can watch them and um, I'll be putting together next season this summer. So if you have ideas, let me know. But um, for tonight, that is a wrap and thank you, Peggy as well for joining That's us. Uh, so thank you everyone and have great. a great summer.